opportunities for good things. Uh, every man a warrior, this, this new study, I'm as, I, I am as excited about it as anything I've ever, ever looked into as far as ministry. Uh, we judge many things by a program. This is not a program. That first book, if you'll thumb through it, deals solely with intimacy with God. Now, here's the outcome. The, the men who meet in groups, and that's beginning to start, and that's both with the ladies and the men, because the ladies parallel the study. Uh, many people have come to me feeling that they don't feel qualified to lead a group. Good. We don't want you qualified. If you feel qualified, you've got a bunch of church stuff in your head. You don't need church stuff in your head. You just need the love of Jesus in your head. Because that first study is developing an intimacy with God. Now, how do you do that? Well, you don't do it on church level. You got to do it on individual level. You don't do it with somebody telling you what the Word of God says. You do it by gaining from the Word of God what God's telling you. And so in every study, you're going to be challenged. What does, what's God saying to you? Is this a command? What, what does it deal with? And every verse of Scripture that you're going to go through. If you're looking at this thinking you've got to be a walking Bible commentary, we're in trouble. Because all we're going to end up with is a lot of church ideology. And a commentary, please remember, is a man's opinion. The Word of God is God's Word. You're hearing from God. The day is going to come for many in these groups before you complete that first book. You are going to look forward to your quiet time where you get along with God and you get in God's Word and you're seeing things God's telling you. Right now, too many Christians don't do their own cooking. And when you don't do your own cooking, you might put in a request for a dish, but there's somebody preparing it. And food preparation or people preparation or Bible preparation isn't what God called us to do. God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. God spoke to Elijah by the dried up brook. You go through the Word of God, you're going to find that people didn't go to somebody to see what God was saying, except in the wilderness wanderings, when the Israelites didn't want God to speak, and went to Moses and begged him, said, hey, when God speaks, it scares us. You go see what God wants and come back and you tell us. And when you begin to do your own cooking, and your own growing. This is what growing by grace is. And it is the thing that the devil will fight tooth and nail because he wants you to be dependent on somebody else. And we all are going to, it's going to happen. And I'm thrilled over it. It's going to work me out of a job. You say, I don't need to go see the preacher. I get along with God, and God's telling me what I need to do. God's telling me how to solve my problems. And, and the study deals with issues that every, every family is faced with. So I cannot tell you how excited I am when this begins to grow. And it's going to be, it's going to be a blessing unlike any. And I also understand, and we have to have a little bit of common sense about this, we have a lot of things on our schedule. If you have a choice between a group and ABI, you do the group. Now, there shouldn't be a conflict because that quiet time should be your worship time. That's your sacrifice time. That hour and a half should be one that you can, you know, you can make that fit. But if your schedule is so tight that you've got to choose 
between doing the groups and doing ABI, do the groups, and then if it's archived, you can go catch the ABI later. It's not that I don't want you here. I love to have you here. That's, that's a wonderful part. But again, I, I mean, every man's a warrior in cultivating holy beauty. That, that's going to be such a blessing to our church and the community. That, that, and, and I'm overwhelmed by it. I took, I took the, the first book to, with me to uh, Mission, Texas, and showed it to Noe Mendoza. And it happened to him like it did me. He stayed up that Wednesday night when I spoke there, left it with him. And by as soon as the offices opened on Thursday morning, he'd ordered books. I mean, they got, they got a great church. And they got a good discipleship program, but he said, I've never seen like this. He says, it's unbelievable. So I hope that you don't think about this as a, as a traditional Bible study. No, no. Every man in the group is a Bible leader. I mean, you're going to grow. You're going to see it. And it's going to be a blessing. So I want to say that up front, and we do welcome you tonight and trust that, that uh, we'll, we'll be blessed and you'll be blessed as we do our study. Uh, I, want, I want to introduce, I, I feel like this will be the semester. Uh, there's some things that's it's a little different approach, at least for me. Uh, I, I, I did have opportunity to, to speak at uh, Bethany Baptist Church and Mission of Athena in Spanish, and, and uh, I think I said it right, but the great church in, on, on Wednesday night. And the, the topic that, that was burning in my heart was from the foundation of the world. And the reason, the reason it humbles me is that after preaching for 50 years, I never noticed it. How could you miss that? I mean, how could you miss that? And, and then I'm talking to myself. Too often we see words or we see a topic or we see a passage or we see a chapter like John 3.16. You memorized it in kindergarten. You say, I know that. But listen, if... For me, 70 plus years later, I'm impressed with what I first heard in John 3.16. I've been unplugged. You ever get an old message on the answering machine? And you guys say, what day did I hear that? Because you say, that's, that's old news. Well, when we first hear the word of God, we hear it as a child, an infant. It's the milk of the word. The more we hear it, it becomes meat. The more meat we get, the healthier we are. And the healthier we are, the stronger we are. And we're better equipped to resist the devil. And so that's why, and that's, a, that's geared into these two studies that we're going to do. That's the heart of it. And, and so if you've got an idea, look through the verse. Well, I know those verses. Well, know them every day. And if you don't see where God's speaking to you repeatedly with fresh news as you read the scripture, then you're just playing an old message on the answering machine. You're playing, replaying something you learned earlier. And, 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 and that's, not, that's not growing. And so that said, it's Tuesday night. Now, I want you to look in your Bibles or you can make notes and... and uh, after going through much of the material with, in the books with Every Man a Warrior, I don't know if it's been, if it's been uh, harmful to print handouts versus letting you write them. Because the more you see it, the more you hear it and see it and apply it, and that's writing it, the more, the more it'll mean to you. So uh, I didn't do the handout tonight because I ran out of time. I got home last night at 9, 9.30, maybe 10. And that all when this morning was just trying to catch up. And then this afternoon, I knew traveling what, what uh, was on my heart. And that's what we'll try to do tonight. But in Ecclesiastes 7, 8, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And be patient in I, I spirit, to, uh, 
uh, is better than the proud in spirit. Now, what I want you to see here, uh, I began looking at the Bible says that, that God knows the beginning from the ending and the ending from the beginning. He knows the start. He knows the finish. And I want to go over to the chart in a bit and, and talk about a few things uh, in, in, in an overview. And that's going to kind of help set the stage for this semester, I, I, I believe. Now, it's sub like anything else, it's sometimes subject to change. But here in Ecclesiastes, there are two things. Better is the end of a thing. Well, I believe our end is a whole lot better than what happened with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Because yep. that's where sin came in and death and suffering and pain and all the stuff we got. It doesn't end there. It ends out in the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. And then the second verse I want you to see is Isaiah 46.10. And here the Bible says, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my, and the word next is what? Pleasure. Now, we're looking at this whole chart. This is, this is Clarence Larkin's dispensation chart. And we're, we're looking at, at the whole chart. And, and by, by stating that, there was eternity past. That's before the creation. And it's an eternity past. That in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, we were chosen, not predestinated, but chosen to be a child of God. Some things happened prior to the creation of man. Jesus already, already volunteered to be our Savior. Already. And we're going to see some things. Uh, and spend a little more time. Like, we're not going to try to fly over 10,000 feet. We're going to try to get down to where the verses are. And, 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 and I'm convicted. I'm not going to use the word convinced. I'm convicted that it's better to know a few verses well than a smattering of a lot that we can't find. I mean, do you ever have a verse come to your mind and you open your Bible and you look and look and look and look and look and I know it's in there, I know it's in there, I can't find it, can't find it, can't find it. Well, that's a verse you know something about. The verses you know well, you can quote. Not just the words, but the chapter and the verse. So it's better to know something. And, and we're going we're gonna to deal with highlights, I mean, key points that I believe, I know for me, they've been life-changing. I hope the Lord doesn't do it. But my idea of heaven and eternity future was so juvenile, maybe even primitive, I'd be ashamed to admit it. How could we spend so little time thinking about heaven when God gave his only begotten son to make it possible for us to be there. And wonder why things about heaven spook a lot of Baptists. <laughs> Scare them out of it. And the book where we get the most of the insight into what heaven is like is the book of Revelation. And how many have you had? How many times have you had somebody tell you, or maybe you said, that I don't read Revelation because it scares me? Well, the only reason it could scare you, you don't know the context of it. If you know when, where, and why, and what's going to happen, and who, then no, it's comfort because you know where we are. And so as we look at this, the picture of the beginning and the end. Ecclesiastes says it's better at the end than at the beginning. And here in Isaiah 
declaring the end from the beginning. And, and, and so what happened in the beginning? Well, we for us go to the Garden of Eden, and there's old Adam and Eve and, and a serpent. And we know the serpent's the devil. And we know that temptation was introduced to Adam and Eve, and they disobeyed God. Nobody was killed. Not then. It wasn't murder. It, 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 it wasn't some terribly moral thing that they did. They just ate fruit God told them not to. And, and I think of how cavalier I have been over that particular topic. Oh, that's not just so bad. What did he do? Well, he just didn't obey. But when it comes to not obeying God, that's serious. I think it's one of the symptoms that we have in our day that, you know, from the, from, from the church, not just the community, but from the church, we've lost our fear. Now, what's fear? Fear is not your heart beating fast and adrenaline pumping. Fear is our respect for God. There were things that I did not do when I was a boy especially a teenager, because I had too much respect for my mother and dad than to do it. Whenever we disobey God, we disrespect God. We have no regarding for him. It's in the, you know, this is something I want. I want to do this. I don't care what you say, God. I want to do this. And I believe that was the attitude that Adam and Eve had when they ate the fruit. It wasn't just an act of God said, don't do it. And they said, well, I'm going to get that cookie out that cookie jar. And they get the hand called in it. No, it was more than that. It was a deliberate act in which they disrespected God, disobeyed God, ate the fruit, brought sin into the world, and with sin came death. But not only did that enter, but there were some companions. Pain prior to, I don't think there's any pain in the world. You know, the, you didn't have briars growing. You didn't have thorns. And then from that point on, man was to earn his bread, his keep by the sweat of his brow. That was through labor. I mean, you wonder, well, what's heaven going to be like? It's going to be everything in reverse of the judgment God brought on Adam and Eve. Because eternity future is going to be a continuation of Eden. Talk about a, a good day coming. That's a good day coming. We're to dwell more on it. I, do you think our young people have a lot of incentive to live for God and love him when we don't even understand it? Where do young people learn it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world? Where do our young people learn what we put priorities on? Got to have education. Got to succeed in life. Driven for life. We should be driven in eternity. We're going to live a whole lot longer there than here. And I'm looking at most of you this morning. When you're our age, it happened quick, didn't it? Didn't it? It happened quick. So the investment we put here, looking to eternity, is laying up treasure in heaven. Not that we'll need money to spend. We'll need life to live. What we are in eternity, or will be, depends on who we are in this life. Because all believers appear before the judgment seat of Christ 
to receive rewards for the deeds done in their body since they believed. And there will be a loss. Corinthians says that some will get into heaven by the skin of their teeth. I mean, just barely in. Would empty-handed lose it all because of our work so burned. It's either going to be gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. The wood, hay, or stubble is going to burn. The gold, the precious stones, and so forth, they receive strength from heat. And so all of who we are that's of the flesh is going to burn. We won't take it into heaven. There will be no carnality in heaven. <clears throat> Hence, no adultery, no immorality. You won't, you won't need to post and focus on, you know, all this, this attitude of rules in heaven. Because it's not going to be there. And that's going to be good. Are you with me? So we're going to focus more out there, but we got to see what happened back there before we go out there, and and, and it's going to be you, you're going to see you're going to see a link that's going to tie in from eternity past all the way over here to eternity future. It's like a bridge, and and then it, there's another thought. This is in Revelation 21, and we're going to take you to the text in a moment. But I want to put two verses together because of tying in what the Lord is, is saying to us in this text. And, and think this, think about it. If we were doing, if we were doing Every Man a Warrior and we were doing this, we were analyzing this text, you're going to look at the who, what, when, where. You're going to look at what's God saying to me and is this a command. I mean, you're going to go through a chain of things and after you do it a few times, every Bible verse you see, that, that bang, 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 is going to pop right in your mind. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see what God's saying to us. He says, and he said unto me, it is done. It's finished. I am Alpha and Omega, which is Greek for what two words? Beginning and the beginning and the end. And then he says it in English. And the beginning and the end I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life. What? Freely. Well, what's water of life? Will we be thirsty? Yeah. Yeah. What else will we be? Let's go to the resurrection and let's go to Jesus when he appeared in the upper room with his disciples and let's go with him to the Sea of Galilee and where Peter and his little entourage, I think, had quit. I think they just resigned from being disciples and they went back to fishing because they were fishermen before they followed Jesus. And they fished all night. The Lord's standing on the shore. Say, hey guys, how's the catch when caught nothing? He said, cast on the other side of the boat. And I know Peter probably didn't say it, but he thought it. Who is that stranger on the beach telling me how to fish? Does he not know who I am? I'm a fisherman. But nonetheless, they cast the net, and when they did, they had so many fish that it almost sunk the boat. And when they get to shore, there's the Lord, and guess what he's doing? He's cooking fish. So if you don't have an appetite for fish, I try to eat fish every week, but I got a feeling that the Crystal Sea, we already had mentioned here the fountain, of the water of life. And we know there are trees and we know that leaves give healing and we know other things are there in, in, in our new Jerusalem, our new home that's awaiting us. So the point that I'm making, and I'm maybe exaggerating it a little bit or romancing it or how you might look at it, I want it to be real to us, that some many of the things that we know in our five senses here We'll know there. Maybe thirst, maybe hunger. And yet the attitude many people have about the new body, 
I, I, most people think we're going to be a ghost. Float on a cloud playing a harp. I can't play nothing now. I mean, you know, you know, 10,000 years, we've just begun. That's a long time to float on a cloud playing a harp. I mean, life is going to be as real there or more so than here. We're going to be busy. So busy that we don't have nighttime. I mean, it's just continuous. And listen, Walmart's got a customer service department in most every other business. But in heaven, there will not be a customer service department. There won't be any complaints. Won't have anything wear out. Won't have to have a warranty honored. And, we'll, you know, some say, well, how old will we be? A lot of people contend Jesus was crucified at about age 33. Maybe 33 and a half. I'm 75. Ask me, would I take a 33-year-old body tonight? <laughs> I mean, just ask me. And then you never grow old. If we got a body like his, and that's 1 John, 3rd chapter, first few verses, if our body's going to be a body like his, then chances are it would be about 33 years old. And in his glorified body, he appeared in the upper room, and he didn't knock on the door and enter the door. He just entered it. So the law of matter is meaningless. He traveled, apparently at the speed of thought, from Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee. We know he ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives, so the law of gravity is defied. Yes, Jim. The days of Noah would pertain to the days, I believe, in the tribulation. And that, I think, will be shut down at Armageddon. So, you know, whatever went on in the days of Noah uh, will be just, a, I think, just an asterisk on history. Uh, we, we, I think we're seeing a repeat of it more and more. Uh, I didn't. Uh, well, the whole time we were gone, we never cut the TV on. So I had a little bit of catching up to do today, and uh, really, really, we didn't have we didn't have time. Has anybody ever been stationed or lived in San Antonio? That is the worst place on the planet I've ever tried to drive. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. And Texas is good about their frontage roads, but my GPS. She heard, I got the English lady talking to me, and she had a nervous breakdown because she couldn't tell the difference between the interstate and the frontage road. And Texas has got these frontage roads with the turnaround like we do here at Forest Brook. And you're on the frontage road, and you get to you do the turnaround, and you're going down the interstate 70 miles an hour, and she tells you to turn around, and you say, you know, where am I going to turn around? And she thinks you're on the frontage road. So every time you'd come to an overpass, she's trying to turn me around. And uh, so, and then, and then, they told me after the fire, by the way, we did get settled with the insurance company. Yay. We didn't come out, but the church got the money, the church's money back that was in it. The money I put in, we didn't. But then God knows that that the locust eats, God has a way to restore. But up until the day, and guess when it occurred? The anniversary of the fire. Three years to the day. But they were saying all the way up, it wasn't paying no more. Paying no more. Paying no more. That was it. And that went back to June of last year. So anyhow, that's been settled. But this phone... Because it was laying out, and I've got trouble with another computer. They said that if the smoke got on it, that that oily stuff. See, the, the fire marshal told me this because I thought we'd close off into the house. 
clean it up and move back in. He said, you won't move back in there. He said, that's oil based because of the fiberglass in the, in the bathroom tub, you know, one of those insert deals in the old, in the eighties, about that thick. He said, that's, that's oil based and all that's going to eventually settle to the floor and you're going to have more soot on the floor level at the bottom of stuff than you do, you know, where it came out, the vents, you know, from the AC. And he did, but this thing has been giving me trouble, and I keep patching it because I don't want to buy a new, especially those new iPhones, you have to sell a car <laughs> to buy those. And so I've been patching it and playing with it, but it decided when I needed it the most, <laughs> it wasn't going to work. Now, the phone worked, but the touchscreen didn't. And I couldn't talk to Siri without using a touchscreen. And I got the GPS lying to me. And I'm trying to get my, my phone to tell me where I need to go. Ended up, we drove 200 miles out the way before we ever figured out what was going on. But anyhow, I'm going to file an insurance claim on my phone. But take three years. Probably. Probably. I, I, now, now, let's talk about where we are. I, I'm going to try to make this work. I have got a voicemail, and this is a dear friend, and she is blind, and she sent me this message, and I'm going to try to get this where you can hear it, but I want you to listen to what she said. I think this is typical of a lot that we got going on. I love to... What did I do? I knew it wouldn't work. That, that, that demon's still in this phone. Let me go back. I, oh, not that one. Go back. Go back. Now, it's, now, no, it didn't. It'll quit, though. It'll quit. Sure, the world. If I want it to work, it'll quit. I've got a phone that's been completely charged. I'll uh, try to go on and finish this. Um, but I, I would it? like to to get to the bottom of this. I, I'd like to know. Uh, I never thought that, that I knew communism could take us. But I never thought that people could uh, could be so, be so filled with hatred toward Donald Trump to, as to do the stuff they're wanting to do. And uh, and I'm praying for the country. Uh, Pelosi, I'm not meaning to pass judgment, but she seems like she's a demon out of hell. Uh, I, I mean, it. She, she's crazy. And Maxine Waters has lost her mind. And, I mean, see, <laughs> And, and she's crazy. And I just, uh, I'm very concerned about our country. Very, very, very concerned about our country. And, and I just really, I'm, I don't mean to be repetitious here, but I just, uh, uh, I just want to know more than I've been able to get. I haven't gotten anything from you. I know you've been having equipment problems and stuff. But I want to know more about this. This this stuff that they're wanting to kill babies after they've been delivered. Consider that an abortion. That abortion itself is murder. But this is terrible. People ought to be arrested for this. And what what we consider good is being looked upon as bad, and what's bad is looked upon as good, and it's disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. And so. Uh, Talk to me. I'm going to send this message. This is the, I think this will be the last of the messages I send you on this deal. It's the third message. So you're going to have to go back. You got this one and two more behind it. I don't know how you just come up on your, on your option list, but uh, I'm, get, I'm sending them. This is the third message of, of and it's the, it's the last one. Uh, when you get it, it might be the last 
next one that, next one that. I'm not sure, but it's, this is urgent to me, and I just want to find out. I don't see, I couldn't text you all this. It takes too much time. And so, um, I, I, I'm very concerned, Freddie, and, and when I said, my God, Freddie, I don't, I don't mean to be taking God's name in vain at all. I just mean God have mercy. What are we supposed to do? So, um, be patient with me. If I said anything wrong, I'm sorry. God, forgive me. But I just want to know what to do, what to say about anything to, to anybody. Uh, um, I'm very, I, I, I can't, words can't even express my concern for all this. Um, I, I really, hmm, just, I don't know, but it, it seems bad to me. It seems like Jesus is going to come back soon. He, well, he doesn't have to do anything to, you know, for God tells him to, but, but, but it's, it's going to get bad, and I'm not, and I don't think, because I think we were, this country, God blessed it when it was founded, and I, yes, sir. Now, I think she's typical. Now, she doesn't have vision. She does hear a lot of television where she gets the news. The problem is that it's difficult to take out the fake news from the real news. But uh, she, I think she just put her finger on the pulse. With what she's seeing... She lives alone, and uh, those, her response or questions, it's real. It's real to her. It should be real to us. And so, if I could just kind of chart the course for this semester, this is, these are areas that um, we uh, are going to try to build on, meaning that for a long time, in prophecy, as uh, Elliot mentioned, the Cold War things stayed pretty pretty stable. Even though we had the threat of a nuclear ex exchange with Russia, uh, but things didn't happen like they're happening now. It's exponential. I mean, it's like drinking from a fire hose uh, you, to, to even begin to try to keep up with with. And most of the researchers I know, uh, they specialize now in one aspect. They don't, you know, before, if you did prophecy, you'd have to do pretty well the full spectrum. And now there's some who just, just, just work on the new world order. The alignment of nations. Because that's what Armageddon's about. Uh, as Elliot mentioned, Russia and Turkey don't get along. But right now they're allied. But they're allied with a common enemy. They're allied going after something. And so let me bring you up to date. Uh, having talked about the end of the beginning, where does all fit? Uh, Elliot was in San Antonio, and, and he shared uh, uh, information from uh, the source there in Israel. And uh, was extremely open, and he made the statement to us that in the past, Israel never, never admitted anything. Wouldn't admit they had a nuclear reactor or nuclear capabilities and so forth. He said, everybody knew we did. But we never admitted it. And uh, he said, but that's changed. And uh, I think it's one of the reasons that there's so much opposition mounting against Netanyahu because he, he shares something in common with, with Trump, uh, President Trump. Uh, there are those in Israel trying to get him out of office. And uh, he, he says, just bring the people and speak directly to me. But it's got to do with a submarine contract, something they bought. And they're claiming he got under the table money. And, and he says, they can't prove that. They didn't. And, and so, you know, it'd be kind of dumb uh, for a person in the position he was in, because he's been there a while as prime minister. And so pray for him. But uh, he, is, he, he is a man where he can draw a line in the sand. And he's going to honor it. And, and he, he does instill um, confidence in the people of Israel. 
they, I mean, that that part they admire, and 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 for all that Trump may have that we perceive as being uh, a, a weakness, his strength is that he's going to keep his word. He said he'd move the embassy, he did, and uh, so we need to pray. But he was saying about Israel in the new, the whole new, and I've noticed in the news when they admitted. Uh, a little later, that they did, uh, they were in. The, they didn't shoot down the Russian plane, but they did stage it. Then that made you know made some headlines, and uh, now they're up front. They have told Hezbollah. They've told Hamas that. Uh, well, he said it, it's we slap them first, and that would be taking out something. And, and, and that slap, he said, is just to get their attention. And he said, if they don't heed what, when we slap them, then we're going to hit them. But we're not going to take it. And he said, and that video you saw was in 17 about war. He said, the war has begun. He said, I live in Galilee. And he said, every morning, night, I hear our jets flying over my house on the way to Syria. And he said, on the way over, they have a particular sound that on the way back is different. And he said, it means they unloaded their payload. He said, we're probably hitting 100 targets a day. And he said, they know it, and we're up front about it, and it's almost like, all right, we did it, what you going to do? And that involves the Iranians, that's Russia in the shadows. And so wh wh what's the relevance for us? And it's Ezekiel 38 and 39, Gog and Magog. If Russia is identified in Ezekiel 38, and nearly everyone I know who, in whom I respect for their knowledge of Bible, and you got to know language, you got to know history, you got to know geography, you got to know all these things to be able to take a name and tie it into a location. But it, they're all saying they believe that it, we know it comes from the north, and due north of Israel, if you get a map, draw a line, you're going to find that uh, Moscow is due north. And then the Allies identified as equal 38. Uh, that, that, if that is what's taking place now, meaning that there will be for, they said, they, they said, we know that we're going to have war. We know it. And they know it twofold. They know it because they know what's in the Bible. They know Ezekiel 38's in the Bible. They know Psalm 83's in the Bible. They, they know that. And they know that battle has not been fulfilled. They know there's an Armageddon battle. I mean, they, they understand that. Now, having said that, it intensifies and I believe fast forwards, you know, the, the, the fulfillment of these prophecies. Now, if we're, if we're studying prophecy, that should mean something to us. Already, we're seeing the signs being fulfilled. This is going to lead, if it's Ezekiel 38, 39 confrontation, if it is, that invading force that's going to go into Israel, they will be destroyed on the mountains of Israel. And you can read the link that takes just to bury the dead and clean up the weapons. That will take place. And uh, is it before the rapture, after the rapture? We just don't know. But I believe we need to kind of take the assumption it could be before. Or the rapture could precede the battle. And we got the stage set. So we ought to be rapture ready. But you know, if you look across, across the country... There are more preachers on the scene, I see them on YouTube, whom I don't know, but they're preaching truth. 
their conferences now being fired back up in regions of the country. Jan Merkel is big on this and probably has in, inspired some of these, some of the conferences. Uh, I think the one she just had had 5,000 people in attendance. And, and uh, oh, just a few years ago, they had a big conference uh, oh, behind the news. The news behind the news, God behind the news. Can't even think of the name of it. Understanding the news. Huh? Understanding the news. No, this is this is the the guy pastored in 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 um, Saint Petersburg. I, that's where I heard Wallace Shabbat. But anyway, they go they having these conferences and they were filling things places up and they went to to Orlando and leased the convention center. In fact, Kyle Ely rode with me. I went to the conference there. I mean, there wasn't enough people there to pay the light bill. I mean, it you know they had a turnout, but it wasn't. I mean, it, it, it's a wonder it didn't sink their boat. So when you do a conference or we do things here like Jubilee, you, you got a budget. There's no guarantee people are going to respond and come. And so that hit prophecy, but now that's coming back. And you got more participation. You got, you got younger guys that, that are stepping up, but not nearly enough who are teaching prophecy. And YouTube does give a platform that's, uh, uh, you know, one that it's not like trying to get TV time that affords the opportunity, but I'm saying this. When Elijah thought he was alone and started whining to God, said, I'm the last one. And God said, no. No, I got prophets you don't know about. And so sometimes we think that we're in this by ourselves and we want the devil. He tries to overwhelm us and depress us. Uh, reality is wherever Satan, it's like Israel. You got the punch. And you got the counterpunch. And, and what this was telling these people, you shoot one rocket, we're going to hit you with 100. So the counterpunch is worse than the punch. And when the devil's doing what he's doing today, God's got a counterpunch that's much stronger than the punch. But the punch, we don't hear about. You see, we're not unified enough to know what's going on. And, and I wouldn't have known. I know that I've heard the Israelis say things about uh, these missions over into Syria, and recently uh, uh, I heard the prime minister say, he, he said, uh, telling Russia, because Russia was threatening them to shoot them down in the airspace. And they said, you tell Hezbollah to quit shooting rockets, we'll quit flying. But as long as there's a threat, we're going to take it out. And this is a part of what he was saying. I didn't finish the the little report a moment, a moment ago, but uh, he was talking about how many assets. They know that Hezbollah has 250,000 rockets in Lebanon that they can fire toward Israel. 250,000. He said we, can, said we can knock down maybe 100. But their goal is to launch a thousand, two thousand at one time, and hit the population centers of Israel. And he said, "We can't, we can't knock that many down. We don't have that capability, and they know we don't. But they don't have the technology would guide it, you know, to guide the missiles. They're getting it, and so part of what they're blowing up is the where where they're." I think the Iranians are shipping it in or wherever they get. They're flying it in and in the cargo holes of passenger planes, mm -hmm. knowing that Israel wouldn't shoot down a passenger plane. But he said, you know, they, they got good intelligence. So that's where the 100 missions a night is coming in. They're blowing up these places as soon as they unload uh, the, the payload. And then another thing, you, you, did you hear that they had found the tunnels? And these were in Lebanon, and that's tunneling the mountain. In fact, one even had a, a, a paved road with, with a white line in it, I guess two-way traffic. But I saw a video of them, maybe Prophecy Update, one, one of the websites. He said, we knew they were building the tunnel. We waited until they finished it. 
He said they spent mega dollars building those tunnels. And when they got them finished, we blew them up. But he said, we also now have technology. And he wouldn't tell us any more than that. He said, we just got technology that when they're drilling, we're hearing. <laughs> and it's interesting. He was saying some of the, the, the girls in the IDF, maybe their ears are better. Uh, I think maybe some had been thinking the tongues were better, but I think the ears <laughs> may be better. <laughs> Kay caught that, didn't she? <laughs> but anyway, and, and they can detect things. And then they've got the capability of locating it. And said, we know, we know that they're, they're digging tunnels right now. Said, we know what's going on. We're going to wait till they finish it. Then we're going to blow them up. And they're confounding them. Because they couldn't, you can't imagine if, if you had... Well, Israel is the size of New Jersey, but not, I mean, you know, land mass, but not Nawad. It's stretched kind of out. And those who've been, you, you, you know it's only 90 miles from Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee. And in parts, it's only eight miles wide. And um, they're in the Sharon Valley. And, uh, and, and so they, they have to. But did you notice even in 2017, when he gave that address at Kufi, his confidence that he said anybody who thinks they're ready for war is kind of crazy. But you, you can see they've got a confidence. They know it's coming. And they've been preparing for a long time. And they told us in 2014 when the rockets were going out of Gaza and, and, uh, that uh, at the Knesset, in fact, I'm trying to think of his name, he was and in one of the Kufi meetings, he's um, the chief of staff. And he said, we know we got to go back into Gaza. But we also know when we do, we'll never come out. Meaning that we'll have to keep an occupational force there to prevent what they're doing. And, and, and also Lebanon. That one day they'll have to go in, but they won't come out. But that part of Lebanon was a part of the promised land anyway. In fact, it goes all the way up to the Euphrates River. So one day that's all going to be God's anyhow. So I'm just saying the table is set. And I don't know that we've got a whole lot of time to just dilly and dally. So if we know that the hourglass is running down, then what should we, you know, what should we do? What should, how, do how do we address it? Well, that's a part of why I did the, the study tonight. It, it, heaven has got to be our focus. And, and so we, we, need, we need to learn all we can. Let's see, I think maybe let's see. Is that what you would tell your friend to call when she was asking? What I, should we do? I am going to call her tomorrow. I didn't have, have time today. And uh, I'll talk with her. And what, what we just have to... One, be ready. We got to, yeah, we got to have, we have to have confidence that he'll see us, that he's going to see us through. We know how it's going to end. Uh, we we don't know where America is in the twenty. See, the next election is it, going to tell us a lot. And if the nation goes totally brain dead, uh, then then it's going to. I mean, it, it's divided now, but there's, in my opinion, there's always been a moral majority. Falwell used that back in the 70s, moral majority. Even among the unsaved, uh, there's some with common sense. Because the other side, I mean, they're proposing a 70% tax rate. And, 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 and this putting everything in, in the same kind of socialistic framework uh, that that would just destroy. Well, you got to destroy free enterprise. You got to you, you got to remove that to put something else in, and that's never been a peaceful transition. I think that Second Chronicles seven fourteen. My people. If my people. Yep. I think God yep. Is crying out to us. Yep. Yep. It's us. And I believe as we claim it, you know, it, 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 you know, as we claim the promises. But I think, I think that uh, family, 
uh, they're looking to us and reading us. It's not what we say. It's how we say it. And if we know, and we don't have to know a lot of Bible, we don't have to memorize the book. But if we know some key Bible passages that will help us, for example, you can open your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and look in verse 4 and say he chose us before the foundation of the world. How long ago was that? And people are well, that's, that, yeah. that's before, before Adam and Eve got into Eden. The plan of salvation was fixed. Yes. I got a text from someone. Uh-huh. Dead on me. So, okay. What do you think about the Pope visiting the UAE and meeting with the Muslims, the Jews, and so called Christians for world peace? They've been working on it for a long time. The prior Pope, the, no, Pope John, was it John? The, the, the prior Pope was a short, short term Pope. And he's still living. Benedict. Now, but the one before Benedict. Before Benedict. Before Benedict. Yeah. John uh, Paul II. Yes. Uh, he, 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 they had a, they had a, a meeting with 65, I got a video on it, 65 world leaders. And, and it, it was, it was a unification meeting. And afterwards, I got calls here from the local Catholic church about wanting to do some, uh, uh, what does the term, well, just combined worship. And, 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 you know, and I didn't know how it would fit. But, I mean, that shocked me. And I thought, well, that's a pretty liberal, you know, uh, priest to, to contact the Baptist church. But that apparently that mandate went out going all the way back, you know, three popes ago. And, and uh, I mean, they had everybody from... From the Dalai Lama to the, I mean, every, every, every faith on just about on earth that could get a representative was there. And, and, and they were all saying that uh, they worshiped the same God. And, and, had, and had a priest, uh, had the, the, the Pope had a picture of him, and he had gone over to one of, it may have been, I forgot which, which Arab country he was in, but he was kissing the Quran there with, you know, the Muslim um, people, and he was saying, we worship the same God. So this is not new, and I think, here's what I think happened. I think it prepared the Catholic Church for it, more so than people outside of the church. That you got this ecumenical kind of kind of trend, but the current pope came out of the oh, what is my mind? It looking good today, so I must be tired. The, uh, no, no, but the movement it was it was in South America strong, and he came. Um, what was the church that President Obama attended with 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 the, with right? Yeah, but what was the name? What 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 it identified? What revolution church? It was. It, it had a name. It's the same thing the Pope was in, and and, and and the same thing he was part of, down in in uh, in uh, was it Argentina? And, and it, it's 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 revolutionary, and, and at the heart of it is socialism. And, and um, it's, it's interesting that we've got, we've got this movement today. The reason that the wall is opposed on our border is because in Europe they took all their state borders down in the UE. And, and then people could go, and once you got, you cross at Gibraltar, you could go anywhere in, 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 in the UE. Didn't have to have, you know, papers to go from, like you change countries here. When I went into Mexico, I had to have my passport. In Europe, you don't have to have that if you're part of the EU. And, and, and so that's what they want. Open borders is that everybody basically is a world citizen. And, you know, for that to take place, and that was a big part of what happened in Great Britain. The French didn't oppose it as much. 
but they had to dissolve their currency, but Britain didn't, and adopt the currency of the EU. And, and, and so that's, that's your one world system, and it's coming. And to make it happen, you do have to have harmony between the Catholics and the Muslims. But see, even more interesting, the money for the new temple in Jerusalem is already on the table, $30 million. And it's coming out of a Muslim country. And the only thing they got to clear is the temple mount, meaning they got to appease the 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 Palestinians, uh, those there in, in Jerusalem, to get to go ahead to start the temple. If that's the place. Huh? If that's the actual place. Oh, it is the place. There's so many people coming out now. I don't now. care how many they got. That question was raised in the summit this last time with the man who is over all the archaeology at the city of David. He said, number one, Millions of people came feast days. There's no way you might fit the temple on, on the city of David, but you won't fit. He said it takes all 30-some acres that they got on the temple mount. And he said not one. And they found the remains. The, the Palestinians got in there, and they took out the field dirt that was there they found enough stuff in the city dump to identify the temple having been on the temple mount so he said it makes for a lot of of um, interesting thought discussion debate but he said one practically wouldn't fit and then two he said we've got enough artifacts that we know we know what the temple is so all right, now, let's think about this chart. I wish, maybe Paul, he's, he's done a lot of the, a lot of the uh, revelation designs, but let's look at this chart for a bit. There are 1,400 Bible verses on this chart. And the chart... And by next week, I'll have, I'll have them out. I didn't have a chance to get that unpacked this time. Starts back at eternity past, and you've got, you've got some color coding here that you can begin to see where um, things on, on the chart have relevance and have place to fit. And uh, early on, though, it's interesting that here we start out on the far left with Lucifer, the anointed cherub, and you got to keep that word in mind, because when we do our angel study, and we begin to learn more about the identity and the, you know, the resume is the word we would use in business today, but if the angel submitted a resume, you'd know what their title was. And Lucifer was a cherub. And you sit in Ezekiel, and that's chapter 20. 20 6 and verse 14 on the chart. And then the world that then was. 2 Peter 3, 5 and 6. Genesis 1, 9 and 10. And then you've got the generations identified creation of the earth. And then you got Isaiah 14, 13 through 14. Where Lucifer is um, apparently given granted access to what appears to be the beginning here of creation. You got the creative week, and then you got the Garden of Eden, and then you got some things going to happen. You got the line of Seth coming out of here, which I don't totally endorse as being the seed line. Uh, it had to be one of Noah's sons after the flood. You got Enoch being, being raptured. And you got the line of Cain identified. And over here, you got a, the, the genealogy here in Genesis that goes to Adam. You can look on here and you can see at the age uh, at his death. And uh, then down here, interestingly, on the chart, you got Taurus, the prison of the fallen angel, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, Jude chapter 6. So you've got fallen angels taking place. So what's happening here 
He's depicted, and this is Doc Goosey who did the chart, there's his name, in heaven, before creation, there was a revolution. There was a war. Lucifer, a cherub, led a revolt that we know later on because of Revelation chapter 13. A third of the angels followed him and they're cast out in Revelation 13. So he, meaning Lucifer, has access. Now over here, you got a line, the trail of the serpent. Going, you got, if, you, if it helps you to have a visual, to visualize something, you got Lucifer identified, illustrated coming to earth, illustrated on this trail of the serpent, evidenced in the Garden of Eden, which was in a time of innocence until Adam and Eve disobeyed God, ate the fruit and fell, brought sin in the world, and that's where you and I uh, are the direct recipients because we inherited from Adam a sin nature. Nobody had to teach us how to sin. We had to be taught right. Wrong is natural to us. And so you, you've got this, you got a battle happening here, and then you've got the Garden of Eden where, well, for us, that was a bad day. And then you go a little bit further, and you're going to get into the flood. Third battle. This one's so bad that God just destroys the world with a flood. And that's where we see over in Matthew 24... The reference to the end times being like the days of Noah. And we know some things happened and how dogmatic we can be on it. I, I don't know, but it was so bad that only a family of eight survived. And, and so we have, to, we have to say, if that's going to be repeated, that... The world's in for some real hard times. And that's where we really have to pray through our witness. But you see in one, you got two, you got three, and then you get the entire Babel. Or Babel. And I... That's one of those chapters that... You learned about it in kindergarten. Maybe I did. I remember early as a child being taught about the, the, where languages came from and how God confounded the, the languages and then man scattered. But again, I didn't connect the serious consequences of that. We'll do that in the study. We're going to Deuteronomy 32. I think that Michael Heiser has great insight because that 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 really turns lights on something else and that's what's going on up here all the way across the top we, we see things in a single dimension or at least I do that's on the horizontal with what's here in life my life but there's a there's a spirit world that so vastly outnumbers our world. I mean, if, if, if the stars are representative and, and only, the only real help we have there, if the stars are representative of the number of angels that we have, then um, that's, that's noteworthy. Uh, because I believe for every soul, there's a guardian. And so if Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the heavens, and if there's at least one guardian per person, and if, you, if you're counting 
stars to get an idea of how many people have populated the earth. And there's an angel behind each one of those, and that's just one class of angels. And then you got terms in the scripture like heavenly host. That's at the birth of Christ over the shepherd fields. And they were all singing. Can you imagine what that must have been? I bet they heard him all over, heard the singing all over the world, didn't know what it was. And uh, they probably, what a sweet sound we heard last night when the angels were, were proclaiming his birth. And then we begin to see that they're, they're the archangels. And we know that Michael, Michael's always in Scripture as a, as a fighter. In fact, he fights with the prince of darkness. You see it in the book of Daniel. And it was the, Daniel's prayers had gotten delayed because Michael was, was warring on his behalf. And the fact it wasn't a quick battle means that he must have been going up against quite a force. And then you, you got uh, Gabriel. And every time we see Gabriel, he's a messenger. He told Mary about the birth of Christ. He told Joseph about the birth of Christ. He spoke to to Zachariah, John the Baptist is dead and, and, and said his name is going to be John. He spoke to Mary and took the message to her. And so we begin to, to, to do our study. We, we're going to try to learn a little more about the angels and that they have, they have responsibility. And, and, and the kicker for us, for me at least, is, is we, we look, there's so much back here. I just kind of jumped from here over to the Gospels and along the way learned a bit about Moses and David and Samson and, you know, and so forth. But not to, not to really just sit there and, and see. And so we want to try to highlight those and, and then... We'll try to focus here on the end. As things you get the beginning, you get the end. But the end, according to Scripture, so much better than the beginning. Because here, eternity, future, never ends. And we never die. There's no record anywhere that the soul of man ever dies. Saved or lost. That's humbling. That every living soul will live eternally somewhere. And the only real assurance we have that we'll live with him is that the blood-bought king, Jesus, died that we would live. That's a good thing too, isn't it? So we're going to try to focus a bit there. And then why don't you go with me to Revelation 21. We're going to put that on the screen and... Talk about this a little bit tonight before we go home. And we did some of this at the end of the semester. So I thought it might be good to start off. You see here in New Heaven, New Earth. In Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, first earth passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I think one of the key words here is that preparation word. We know in John 14, he has gone to prepare a place for us. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. And that preparation was not made by us. Just as the, the home, he, he, in John 14, let not your heart be troubled, believe me, I believe also in me and my Father's house, so many mansions, I go to prepare a place for you. So this prepared place is by Jesus. Our prepared heart is also the work of Jesus. Because we can't save ourselves. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It is by the grace of God. And then if you'll look with me and say, we do, we got, got 15 minutes. 
Look, look with me, verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Don't you look forward to the day that we get to hear the great voice? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's another thing. You know, what, what's that going to be? A great voice. Look at this now. A, a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Uh, someone asked me recently, did, did, did I camp? And not really. I kind of got enough camping when I was in the Army. And, and uh, I know people enjoy it, and that's good. But the idea of the tabernacle is camping. Camping is not formal living. And God wants us to live with him. Look, look at that verse now. Let's let it talk to us. You got the great voice out of heaven. We're told, behold, the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. Now, is he saying in that last phrase, look at this now, think about it, we're practicing what will be going on with every man's warrior and, you know, cultivating holy beauty, because every passage you look in, you're going you're to be taken apart, but he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. Well, he's going to dwell with men. If you go back to the tabernacle, God is with men. It doesn't say he's going to be dwelling with the angels. Whether they're cherubs or whether they're guardians or whether they're arcs or whatever. He's going to dwell with men. Hallelujah. Wouldn't it be good? You ever lived in a bad neighborhood? Think about living next door to God. I mean, you don't have to, you know, you, what a neighbor. You know, you just think about what, you know, what, what a privilege we have. You can't, doesn't that just kind of break it down to where... It becomes more of a reality than, than something imagined. And then he, he, he says, and, and he, he says, and they shall be his people, and God shall be with them and be their God. Now look in verse 4. Look how personal it gets. And God shall wipe away how many tears? All tears from their eyes. So it leads me to believe that whenever this event takes place, that they're going to be some pretty battered people. I'm going to use the word battered. You got the aftermath of Armageddon. You got all the other stuff that's going on. And, and, and they're going to be some, let's just say it this way. There may be some broken, broken hearted people. But the Bible says that he's going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now, what goes away with the tears? Everything that ever broke our heart goes away too. So in heaven, can you think about it with me? Can you imagine living and never having another moment of anxiety? Not another anxious moment. Not another dread if a phone call comes or... As some already have lost loved ones recently and have been through that, that sorrow tunnel that we go through, leaving a loved one. Never happen again. Think about it. That's, that's a part of what, what's in the future. I mean, that's, that's what he's prepared for us. And then look, look a little more in the text. He, 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 he gives us this picture. He says, not only, not only we wipe away all tears, there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there, shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. That's over. It's over the moment we got our glorified body. And I can be honest. What was it? Somebody, was it somebody they had in the paper? Oh, they lived it was 117 years old? 129? Can't imagine it. Oh, I don't know how you keep Ida's brothers away from, from that, but you think about never growing old. And, and, and so our future, how good is that? Is anyone here 
who can guarantee any of this to the person you love, be it a child, your husband, your wife? No. No, it's not earthly possible that we could do any of this. It's all about heaven. So as we focus on heaven, it, it, it will become sweeter and sweeter every day. And then if you'll look in verse 5, he says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make how many things? All things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Now John saw it. That's going back to the first verse. John saw it. God showed him. I think Paul saw it. Paul said he couldn't tell you. He didn't have words to describe it. And then if you look on in. Now let me say this. If John saw it, Paul saw it. And I know that they're messengers to us. But you know, if we got hungry, he might let us get a little glimpse. Might just be able to get a little glimpse. Verse 6. He said unto me, it is what? Done. That's our text earlier. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water uh, of life freely. And then look in verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit how many things? All things. So does that mean to be an overcomer? Does that mean that there might be some challenges or some struggles in this life? Absolutely. Why? Is God punishing us? No. It's the price of sin that Adam and Eve brought into the world back in the Garden of Eden. Listen, there's not been any man on earth who has not had things to overcome. I don't care what his last name was. In our day, I don't care if it's a Trump, I don't care if it's a Rockefeller, I don't care if it's a Kennedy, I don't care what the last name is. In fact, I've read articles stating that in, in Hollywood, among the richest, they're the most miserable. Money does not bring peace of mind. And in fact, I think I also saw where the, the, drug, the drug rate and suicide rate is higher on the West Coast. And yet they're the most affluent. So there's some things money can't give us. But he does. And thank God it's free. Isn't that a blessing? Now, this is prophecy. We're talking prophecy tonight. This is, this is future. Our future state. I don't know that I've been effective in communicating this to our kids and younger generations. Yes, everybody wants to go to heaven. Heaven's more than a fire insurance policy. Heaven's more than a fire escape. It's a reality of life. And it should be a place that there's that longing in our heart. And I'm going to give you a good Bible example. And that's a man called Abraham. Abraham, the Bible says, and he was rich, looked upon his life as a stranger, a pilgrim on earth. This earth was not his home. He looked for a city whose architect, the builder, wasn't built with hands, but built by God. So he was homesick while here on earth. We should, if we grow in his grace and in his word, we will become homesick for our new home. Now, I know what it, it's like to bounce around. I never dreamed it ever happened to us. I'm, I'm, I'm going to share a little something with you, and that'll be a good closing point because 824. My wife, during the three years... Well, two and a half, three quarters, that we were a vagabond. 
And that was between a camp of four and a half months. I can't even get my wife and daughter to walk close to one, let one, let one go in one. And that's not against people who camp, but never then, not on Folly Road, not up at Arrowhead, uh, wherever that place was after the, uh, the National Guard evacuated us off Folly Road with the flood in 16. We lived there for about a month and then back to Folly Road, Folly Road to Lander. Uh, over in front of the Conway Hospital in there for almost a year at Lander. And then in August of, of, of last year, we went back to Grandview Drive. Other than Christmas, Thanksgiving, maybe special occasions. Most of the time we went to King, so we didn't. The, they might have come to the house and then she would have done things like, you know, finger food with, with the family when they came. My wife has cooked five Sunday dinners in a row. Grandkids love it. They love it. They're putting in the recipe. It, you know, it's amazing how not being home can affect us subconsciously. Now you got to catch this. Wonder if it does not work that way about heaven. If heaven isn't on our hearts, if that's, you know, if we're, like Ab if we're not like Abraham and our home isn't here, it's there, we might not be doing much heavenly cooking. Will the family circle be unbroken? That should be our challenge. And I do believe the rapture is near. Even some of the Orthodox Jews, one uh, that's spoken, and uh, they, had, they had some good people. They liked the guy over the city of David, that arch archaeologist. And he told us about They found some coins, by the way. Uh, temple coins that were burned in 70. And, and uh, then they found some that, that were not touched by the fire. But apparently some of these uh, they found some that when people were fleeing the temple, they must have had some coins with them. But anyway, one day, what's that song? We'll all understand it better by and by. One day, if we do what I believe he'd have us do, we'll prepare our hearts for heaven. Because we could be there as quickly as Enoch got there. The Bible says he was walking with God and he was not for God took him. And I heard old country preach say it this way. He said, God and Enoch must have been talking. And God looked down to Enoch. He said, Enoch, you're closer to my house than yours. Come on home. And he raptured him. And so I want to live that way too, don't you? That I'm closer. I'm closer to heaven than I am earth. But that doesn't mean we don't have a job to do. And as long as we've got life, breath here on this earth, we must rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Because that day, I believe, is soon to come. Well, we've gotten off to a start tonight. Next week, we're going to focus in on some of the areas that we've mentioned and try to go in a little more depth, give you some things to think about that would be easy to, well, let's do it this way, just have a, a talking point where you can have a conversation. And, and I believe as we begin to share faith with family and friends, and we don't do it from the traditional point, we just do it from our heart, that it's going to register. And uh, already uh, I've seen some family who have become more open to, to uh, listen and uh Think about what you know, what's going on, and how how it may affect us. Lord Jesus, thank you tonight for your grace, your mercy, your blessings. Help us have answers as the phone call. The world is falling apart in many, many, many aspects, but at the same time, never has your grace been stronger. Never has your glory 
been been any brighter for us as it is today. Bless us, Lord. Use us. And I know there's some refining that you're doing and some refocusing, but we give you glory for it and praise. And bless those that watch by the way of the stream. If they if they've got a burden, I pray you'd lift it. If they got a need, I pray you'd meet it. If they need you as Savior, may they receive you as Savior. Invite you into their heart to experience a marvelous grace of salvation. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before you leave, yes, Paul. Uh, so everybody knows the live stream did not go out. We were having a problem with it. it, it I did record this. And uh, Cameron will be able to upload it tomorrow. Oh, good. Okay. So um, they had a problem Sunday night. Oh, oh they, they did, did too. They did. They did. And they didn't yeah. know that it was still having a problem. Okay. So okay. when I called Cameron tonight, he said okay. it's not working. Okay. Uh, he's seen it's supposed to be working, but it wasn't connected. Okay. So that's a YouTube part. Okay. I, okay. And uh, also, if you have a topic, just like the, the call that Sylvia got, let me know. If you don't have an email, I'll give it to you quickly. It's FMY7543. What is that? Yeah.